Thanks for joining us today for Master Coaches Wednesday Weekly Buzz and our after show Buzz Reaction. I'm Ruth Nelson, joined by Hall of Famers Mick Haley, Bob Bertucci, and Brian Gimlero, bringing you the most current issues and trends in volleyball. Our weekly show has leaders in our sport provide their perspective on the questions that are asked, along with discussions on topics that are current and ones that are affecting all of us. Our newsflash, USA Beach Team, Ross and Climate take the gold. And for the first time since volleyball began an Olympic sport in 1964, our USA Women's Indoor Team takes home the gold. 60% or 66 of the 113 medals of US at Tokyo were women. If U.S. women were their own country, they would have finished fourth in the Olympic medal count ahead of Great Britain, Japan, Australia, and Germany. Is this a result of Title IX that was signed by President Richard Nixon in June 1972? Want to make a difference? Please remember to renew your ABCA membership. This one organization that represents all coaches at all levels when lobbying for the changes that are needed in our sport. And you can make a difference by registering at abca.org. Well, today, our guest is no stranger for any of us as he's former CEO of USA Volleyball, the former head coach of the 1984 men's gold medal Olympic team. He will be providing us his thoughts on the Olympic TV production, the USA efforts, and where are women's and men's indoor and beach programs going? and as well as some interesting observations about the Olympics. So let's head over to Austin, Texas with former Olympic coach Mick Haley, who will introduce our guest today. Mick. Thank you, Ruth. And this is a real pleasure to have Doug Beal on the show. Doug, welcome and thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. And Gosh, what a, what a wonderful group to uh, be talking to. This is great. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to do something uh, real quick for our listeners. Uh, I'd like to condense about 60 years of your life into a paragraph, uh, if I can okay. do that. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting. I watched an interview you did uh, online less than a year ago. Um, one of the things that uh, you said in that interview was really quite interesting. I know uh, Bob, Brian, and myself and Ruth all feel kind of the same way that, that you said a lot of us learned to coach and got involved by coaching our own teams. And uh, I had forgotten about how we used to play and coach at the same time. And uh, uh, we learned to get along with our teammates and make decisions uh, that were acceptable to everybody. So uh, that uh, is kind of the way I wanted to start with, with you getting involved in the game. You used to uh, actually uh, uh, play at Ohio State. You coached at Bowling Green when you were going to grad school there. You coached Ohio State. Uh, you ran the, the Columbus Caps uh, open team uh, with a lot of uh, Midwest people and West Coast people that will remember that. You uh, were very, very successful uh, when you became uh, USA head coach uh, because you were able to start our first full-time training center in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, and that's more significant than I think anybody realizes at that time because uh, we all went to the 76 Olympics as spectators. And uh, the only one that got a better seat than you and I were, was Bob Bertucci. And he got to sit down on the floor because he was coaching for Army and they had the inside line on, on seats. And I don't know if you knew that or not, but- uh, No, that's, we, a, that's a new one for me. <laughs> yeah, they were, we were actually studying the game trying to figure out how USA was going to qualify to go to the Olympics in the future and how we were gonna win gold. And you were able to, to come up with the, the concept for a training center, get USAV to sponsor that. Then you were able to, the training center moved to San Diego and then later and, and is now in Anaheim. But uh, you were able then to be the first USA coach uh, winning an Olympic gold for our men in 84. Um, you went overseas and coached in Italy, uh, got some very interesting experiences over there. I, I listened to a couple of those comments, came back and did two quadrennials as the USA coach again, um, and finished up by becoming CEO of our association for 11 years uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, I, we couldn't think of a better person that could give us uh, a perspective on where volleyball is in this country right now. 
And secondly, where our national teams, all, all four of them, the two indoor teams and the two outdoor teams, where they are right now and, and what we should be looking for in the future. Uh, can I throw that one at you and let you go after it? Yeah, that, that'll be easy. Make thanks. <laughs> um, oh, boy. Um, so I appreciate, I appreciate the retrospective. I, I thought that might just use up most of our time here. Um, <laughs> Yay! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, I think, I think volleyball is in a, a spectacularly great place right now, uh, in the United States and frankly, around the world. Um, I think it's grown dramatically. Uh, you talked Mick a little about the coaching evolution in our country. Uh, I think that's one of the, um, I, I don't know, terrific, um, drivers of, of our sport. Uh, we, we have a robust uh, and ever-growing uh, professional coaching uh, population. Uh, I, I think it's, um, it's just impressive where it's come from. Uh, most of us uh, had, had to coach or we wouldn't have had an opportunity to play back in the you know, 70s and before and, and, and later. And so, um, it's hard for me to think of a part of our sport that isn't really uh, successful and growing right now. And, and I think that clearly has lots of influence over the success of our, of our international teams, uh, frankly, both indoor and beach, both on the men's and the women's side. So the short answer is uh, I, I can't think of, a, of another sport that's in any healthier spot than we are. Um, certainly in the Olympic world, uh, we're, we're just in a great place. I think, I think USA Volleyball is in a wonderful position to take advantage of that in all kinds of different ways. And, and maybe we can get to some of those ways, you know, later in the conversation. So, so I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic about the sport and, uh, and its uh, trajectory for the future and what that means for our national teams. Well, I'm excited to hear that. that that's extremely encouraging. Uh, obviously, I think you had a little bit to do with hiring our, our two present indoor coaches uh, um, and hopefully uh, it, it, yeah. we can continue with that kind of quality as head coaches, but they, they've done a, a pretty remarkable job. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't have the result in the men's we wanted and we had a, the result we've never had before in the women's. Um, the same a little bit in the, in the beach, but I, I think that goes in cycles sometimes. And so we have to be a little bit patient, but I see no reason why uh, that can't con continue. I, I forgot to mention one thing. I was going to say your years and experience actually uh, allow you to be a member of the master coaches. So we welcome you from that <laughs> standpoint too, with all the four of us here, uh, John Foreman, I don't know uh, how you, you get in with the master coaches, but we will let you in. That's good. Hey, um, I'm going to pass you along to Bob Bertucci. Uh, he's got some sure. very significant questions. And as being the men's coach uh, at Sacred Heart University, uh, uh, it's, it's good to hear his perspective. So Bob, why don't you jump in there with Doug? Sure, Mick, thanks. Doug, thanks again for, for coming on. Sure. Uh, yeah, I do have a couple of questions. The first one related to the game in general. You know, the analysts had hit on this. I, you know, I kind of felt this was somewhat true, just watching the offenses that were being run by the, the men's teams, you know, the, the kind of bringing back the tandem and the, and the X play using the backcourt. Uh, what, how, how do you feel? I mean, what's your observations? Is the men's game, was, was that being played, as the analysts said, at a more sophisticated level than the women's game. And, and, and what thoughts do you have on that? Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I would use the, the word sophisticated. Um, I, think, I think the men's game is uh, so powerful and so fast uh, and the ball speed is so great. Um, that maybe we confuse that with sophistication. Uh, so, I, and I'm not really sure what, what we mean by sophistication. The, the plays you reference, um, I guess I'd call it options. I think there are more options available to men's attackers right now. And uh, the options happen uh, quicker together. And most of it is between 
the speed to the to the two pins in one area and then sort of the the creation that teams make out of the middle using much more variety out of the back row so we call it the pipe or bic or or you know we use different terms um and so i i think in that sense yeah that's pretty sophisticated um and teams do it different ways and it's really difficult to um to defend because the timing between two attackers is is so minimal um and so you know, we used to talk about read blocking. It's just harder and harder. Uh, it's harder and harder to do. Uh, blockers, I, I think, are getting forced to make decisions, uh, at least in some pre-movement uh, sort of alignment that they didn't have to do, oh, I'm going to guess, you know, probably even two Olympics ago. So it, it's evolving really quickly. And I think, I think from the women's perspective, uh, size of the players, the physicality of the players, the speed of the offense, all of that is, is mirroring almost exactly the men's game. Um, I see a much wider variation of what women are doing uh, out of the back row and with the middle hitter. So a lot of it, in, in my view, is, is really similar. Um, I guess I, to throw some other potential areas we could talk about, I, I didn't see, and I don't see quite as many women hitting a jump spike serve as I might have anticipated four or five years ago. Um, you know, on the men's side, it's unusual if you have uh, one or two of your starters that don't hit a jump serve. On the women's side, you might have one or two that do. Um, and so that, that's a pretty big difference. You know, but the, the relative height of the net makes serving pretty, pretty um, challenging on the, uh, for the receiving team in the women's game versus the men's game. And so that sort of makes up for it. Um, so, I, you know, the two, the two games are pretty close together right now. It, it's, it's really interesting. And, um, and I think as much as any other sport, you know, volleyball, has figured out the adaption to make both sports fantastically entertaining and, and fantastically interesting. And uh, I'm sure we're going to get to the serving issue here at some point. In the, uh, <laughs> well, in why don't we just jump into that. the serving issue right now, since you sure. already brought it up. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's difficult for me, you know, coming from the women's game and, and, and to the men's and back to the women's and back to the men's and, and this time around coming back to the men's game and seeing, you know, the number of missed serves in the men's game. I mean, how do we solve this dilemma? Uh, you know, and, and, and let's talk a little bit about that and, and, and maybe the, you know, the percentages of, of games we lose because of, of missed serves as compared to, you know, games we win because of that, you know, high speed jump spike serve. Yeah. Um, so ser serving for sure and passing along with it are, are impactful parts of the game. Um, and, you know, on the men's side and certainly on the women's side too, um, it, it's hard to win, uh, not impossible, but hard to win if you're not competitive in, in that environment. And, uh, and certainly it, it's not, uh, uh, it's not difficult to say that that was an issue for our men's team in, uh, in Tokyo. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not privy to all the stats and there's lots other ways to evaluate serving and passing, but we were missing more than our, uh, our opponents in the pool round. And, and we weren't getting as many direct points as our opponents by, you know, a big enough margin that it was a factor. Um, you know, how do you address it? Boy, I mean, that, you know, that, that's, a, that's a much more complicated issue. Uh, you know, I mean, the easy answer is we have to get better at it. We have to be better. And whether that's a philosophy or training time or individual limitations in, you know, in, in having a great arm swing, uh, you know, I, it's, it's probably a little bit of all that. Um, and, and certainly John is as aware of it as anybody. I mean, he, I, I've had hours and hours honestly of discussion about that and I don't, I don't know that anybody really has a great answer um 
but for sure the teams that are winning at a high level on a regular basis are missing less than 15% of their serves. We, we were five or six percentage points above that. So uh, that, and that's a lot. Um, and then, you know, the, the ACE percentage has to be something in the area of, you know, five, 6%, uh, I think, to really be competitive for a medal uh, in the men's world. And we were not at that level either. Um, well, does, the, does the net yeah. have that much of a, a factor here? I mean, the, the women, I know philosophies, you know, I'm not second guessing any of the coaches. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, if there are some different philosophies in attacking with the serve at all costs as, compo as opposed to, hey, we got to get 90% of the, the serves in. But, yeah. but does the net height make a difference where you, you see most of the men jump spin serving, where maybe the jump floater, you know, over that, you know, eight foot net uh, is just not as effective as it is over the women's net. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that any of us know the answer to that, Bob. I, I'm not going to try. I'm not trying to duck the question. Um, but I think uh, um, I, I, my sense is that that's not an issue, that, that the height of the net is not an issue. I mean, there are just there are so many examples of of men who um, you know, get the, get the serve in at that 90 plus percent that you're referencing, which I'm not really sure we know enough about that. Um, you know, the, the real, the real stat that I think is compelling about serving is, is what percentage of the time that player X, Y, or Z is serving that we're either scoring a point or we have an opportunity because um, the, the offense is somewhat limited, uh, you know, that they don't have every option available. And, and my own sense, again, I, I don't have all the stats in front of me. And I, I know you guys are going to talk to some of the stat uh, <laughs> people from, from both teams. Um, but I think, uh, I, I think you want to know uh, how many opportunities out of all the serves, you know, player X, Y, and Z are, are creating opportunities to, uh, to, to score. And on the reverse side, I think the compelling stat is when, when our team or any team doesn't pass the ball really well, what's our ability to, you know, first get a really good swing and second convert on that. You know, how many times do we win that rally? Um, and I think that's, that's the difference. And, and honestly, you know, watching the gold medal match on the men's side um, and then comparing France in that match with their loss to the U S in the first pool match, huge difference there. I mean, France was terrible transitioning in that first uh, loss and they were really good against uh, Russia, you know, or <laughs> whatever they're called now um, <laughs> in, in the gold medal match. And, and I, I honestly think, you know, fewer matches are won and lost actually from the service line. More matches are won and lost by your ability to kill the ball or win that rally from a pass or a dig that isn't, you know, really uh, where you'd like it to be. I think, I think that's the compelling stat, uh, probably on both sides. And I know I've, I've told this story and I think if you, if you talk to Karch, you know, he'll tell you the same thing. Part of the reason that they won the world championships in what was it, 2014, is because he really changed a, a number of players from being jump spike servers to jump floaters. And they focused a lot of attention on that skill in the three, four months leading up to the world championships that they won in Italy. And he thinks, and I, I tend to agree, and I was at that tournament, um, that had a huge impact on the ability of the, that team to be good and be successful. Um, and I think I saw... a not exactly the same thing because he doesn't have, you know, there's only, only Mike Hancock right now that was a jump server on right. his team, but they have been uh, over, over the last three, four years as good a serving team with jump floats as anybody in the world. And I think both in the semi match and in the finals, they significantly outserved their team, the, the, the opponent, and, and when I've seen us lose to Brazil in the past, it recently on the women's side, we've been outserved and struggled passing uh, in, in that 
that, that matchup with that team. Um, I'm not sure that was the case with Serbia in the semi-match in Rio, but I think it was a couple of times with Brazil uh, before that in some- uh, Well, there's Olympic no Olympics. doubt that the, the, the women in, that, in the championship match were, were serving bullets at, at, uh, at Brazil. And I, I think you know, that made a huge difference for them putting that pressure on them. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna let it go over to, to Brian, Doug, and let him uh, get a question in, and, and I'll come back if we have time. You bet. Hey, Doug, it's nice to see you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, you too. Uh, let's talk specifically about this this Olympics, uh, one with the women's double win, an indoor and beach, and then what you think of the seating, what you thought of the tournament, what you thought of the television coverage. Uh, it's a quick question. I'm sure you can do that quick. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, um, yeah. yeah. You know, so so when I say that volleyball is in a great place in this country, that that's not at all mitigating the the big difference between the popularity on the women's side and the men's side. And I think, you know, increasingly, in my view at least, uh, we're seeing that play out in our in our national teams. Um, and uh, you, you know, there's so many ways to go into it, but. One of, one of the problems on the men's side is simply depth. Uh, and again, if, if you look at the, at the finals on the men's side with, you know, Russia and, and uh, France, they're, they're playing or recently did play essentially all 12 players on their roster. You know, we're, we're just not in a position to do that in a meaningful way right now because of depth. And so when the men enter the tournament without an Aaron Russell and with some other key players a little bit beat up, uh, we're, we're, we're gonna struggle. Uh, we just don't have the, the population that allows us to be exceptional uh, in, in the depth area, in my view, uh, that we do on the women's side. And, and I think you saw it so dramatically uh, demonstrated by the women. So, uh, you know, Jordan Thompson goes down, uh, Jordan Polder goes down, the women still can perform at this terrific level and, and win. And I think, you know, it's a result of Title IX, it's a result of the popularity of the sport, it's a result of all kinds of different things, but it's, it bodes well. And I think, you know, in a big picture sense, you see the same thing on the beach side. We've got a, uh, a women's team that qualified that had really only been playing for a couple of years internationally, essentially right out of NCAA beach, which is just Terrific. And so to me, um, it, it's, it's not entirely, but it, there's a little bit of a numbers game going on here. And we've got to figure out how to solve that. And so it's, it's probably more critically important that John and whoever are coaching on our men's side at the national level, keep that team healthy. It's really, you know, I, I think we have a different result on the men uh, if Russell plays, if Jeske is 100% healthy uh, the way he was at a World Cup a, a while back, you know, if um, Taylor Sander is 100% and doesn't miss some time, uh, you know, if we don't have to depend on Matt Anderson to, to take, you know, 35 or 40 swings. So it, it, it's really a challenge, you know, relative to the tournament, um, I, I think yeah, I, I just I want to give so many plaudits to Karch. I think he solved um, and upgraded his team in two just enormously significant areas. Um, you know, for me, uh, the MVP of his team was uh, was Justine, the Libro. I, I just thought she was fantastic the whole tournament. And then, you know, the two opposites that he had just both played terrifically well. And I'm so impressed because you've got two new setters that never played in Olympics, two opposites never played in Olympics, a Libro never played in Olympics, and, and you win a gold medal with, and I'm probably missing one or two. Um, so the ability to integrate players quickly into a meaningful role on the women's side is just something that we have now because of the depth and also Karch's and his staff's ability to do that uh, at a really impressive level. And, and I frankly was saying that about John uh, a year or two ago, 
and I just think he suffered from some some challenging health issues with a, a much different depth of roster um, to try to get to one of these others. The seeding is absurd at the Olympics. The fact that all four men's teams from one pool finish one to four has happened before. I, I think you can change it with a simple issue. You just, you don't give the host country the number one seed. I think that alone would make a big difference. Not every Olympics, but certainly in, in plenty of them. Um, and then, you know, I, I mean, I think the coverage was great. I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of, um, of, of Paul and, uh, and Kevin and, and Chris on the beach side. I, I think they do a really, I don't know, competent, entertaining job of analyzing. And I watched a lot of the streaming too with some of the other announcers and I had to turn the sound off um, to, just to enjoy it. Uh, so I, I, you know, volleyball is at a, just a great place. Um, uh, the, the big downside to me of the Olympics is uh, for, for volleyball and beach too now, it well, didn't start that way for beach, but it's evolved that way. It's, it's just a really long tournament. And you have to, gosh, you have to figure it out that way. It, it's, um, you're not going to be the same team every match. You're not going to be the same team the first week that you are the second week. It, it's hard. It, it takes a lot of focus. Um, and that's why depth, I think, is so critical. And, and you saw it in so many ways. Uh, the, the, the unexpected, I'm, I'm not going to say they're really upsets, just unexpected results. Uh, they were all over the place here. Okay, Poland. Doug, I hate to interrupt you, yeah. but we are out of time. And okay. Brian didn't want to say it, but I'm going to say it. So I'm going to end it with this. And with my question, it's really not going to be a question. It's going to be a statement. Olympians don't have to skip NCAA. As more Olympians can keep their prize money, sign the NIL deals, and compete for the universities and get a degree. What is better than that? <laughs> all right. For those coaches that are interested in our consulting services, please go directly to our website, volleyballmastercoaches.com. Click on the contact form, and we look forward to customizing in-person or virtual clinic and or training for you. If you missed any of our shows, jump over to our Instagram, click on our YouTube link. Follow us on Facebook, Volleyball Master Coaches, and Twitter and Instagram, VB Master Coaches. Today, registration is open for the 2021 ABCA convention in Columbus, Ohio, December 15th through the 18th. Jump over to abcaconvention.org to register. Stay on Facebook Live after John closes our show today, as we will hear master coaches on their thoughts about the recent Olympics, as well as our guest who is a performance performance analyst for the USA Volleyball with his thoughts while attending the 2020 Olympic Games. Now let's go to our Buzz and Buzz Reaction digital partner, Dr. John Foreman, who will update us on our most recent project. And Doug, thank you very much for coming on. And to you, John. Thank you, Doug. Ruth, thank God you're here, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> wrap it all up. That's what we say. We might be on for a couple of hours if Ruth doesn't cut us off. All right, John, you are on. Uh, thanks, thanks to Doug as well. Um, current project is getting my team uh, sorted out for preseason because we start like next week um, and kids are already starting to flow in. So, but I do have uh, a coaching clinic coming up that I'll be able to share some content from. So look forward to that. Um, so with that, we'll wrap up uh, the buzz and head into the reaction. For those joining us for the Buzz Reaction for the first time, today we begin with our master coaches continuing discussion on the buzz with regard to USA Volleyball at the Olympics and how we can continue to grow the sport now that the indoor and beach women's won gold medals. So let's head over to Brian. You, I, I know you had a question. Well, I want to thank Doug before he gets off because okay. Ruth. He actually answered my next question I was going to ask without me asking. Hey, but I never got to ask my question. So whatever your question was. Oh, so what, kind of wax, what kind of wax are you using on your surfboard? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's no, right. No answer for that. Okay. <laughs> hey, it, was Ruth, it, was, it was fun. Ruth, we still have Doug on here. So why don't you ask your question? We'll just take a few minutes. Yeah, and, let's go ahead. Yeah, I, I, got, I, got about, I got about two or three minutes. I we'll apologize. give him two minutes. That'll be yeah. good. Okay. 
So with NIL, uh, name, image, and likeness, and then the yeah. realignment of college football and basketball teams for 2025, and everybody's fighting to what conference, and USA having half the Olympians coming from university programs, what do you think the positives this could give volleyball for the upcoming season? Well, the new norm, which we don't know what that means. How do you think this could help volleyball? I, I actually think it has the potential to help all the Olympic sports. Uh, I think um, I, I think I saw you mention something about the the number of NCAA athletes across uh, all sports, all countries. Yeah, it was it was huge um, in in Tokyo, and it's it goes up all the time. Uh, and so, same with with our women versus men winning medals. Um, I, I think you're going to continue to see a separation. Um, so no, no country supports women, women's athletics like we do across all sports. Um, but I, I think NIL, you, you know, the first year is going to be really chaotic. Um, I, I think the, the NCA has just sort of bailed out on this thing, which is really embarrassing to me. Um, but I, I think it's going to, I think it's going to allow, um, athletes to, to feel like, you know, I can stay in school. I can make money. I, I mean, I can transition directly um, in a comfortable way uh, and, and move on. And, you know, the pro side of, of, um, of volleyball is robust uh, and growing. Uh, I think the, the potential for pro leagues, viable, sustainable sort of pro leagues in this country is, is pretty real. Uh, there's, uh, I think I know seven ventures of at some level that are either talking about it or actively raising money or you know as athletes unlimited are actually out there performing um uh, so i i'm i'm pretty optimistic about that uh, i i really think volleyball is in just uh, as good a spot as as we could be and uh, and bob you probably see this more directly than i do but you know d3 is is going through the roof um yeah, every uh, every year they're adding yeah. more teams. Yeah, it's, you know, we're at a what 120 or something like that right now, and um, you know the First Point Foundation has added I don't know three or four D1 programs. Um, I, I don't think there's another sport that can show, especially during the pandemic, the kind of growth trajectory that the volleyball can. So I'm I'm incredibly optimistic, and, and obviously there are issues. You know the Olympic Committee itself lost a big chunk of, of revenue and, and, af, um, and staff, so did most national governing bodies. Uh, but, but I think we're going to recover from that pretty quickly. And, you know, hopefully this, the Delta variant is the last one we deal with and we, and we get through it. It's taking longer, sadly, for any number of reasons. Um, but I think we're just, we're just in a great spot. And, and I think the men are going to solve these issues. I, I think they're, they're solvable. Uh, it, it's a little more, a little more random on the men's side. You know, we have to, we have to find that population. And some of the questions were, you know, who's going to be the, the next opposite and who's going to, I don't know, who's going to fill the roster. I, I, I don't know the answer, but I, I think we, we have population out there that's um, certainly not as, as great as the women, but I think we, we can solve those issues. So. so second part of that question real quick, athletes unlimited. Was that a positive and what did it do to grow the women's pro league opportunities in the United States? Yeah, hu hugely positive, hugely positive. And, and I'm separating whether I think that's the right model right. and all that, all that other, cause it's certainly different and, you know, they have their own priorities, but um, I, I think the vast majority of the players had a great experience from the feedback that I, I can uh, call. Um, you know, my big question for them is tell me where you're going to be three years from now. What, what does it look like three years from now? Are you going to have a second bubble? Is it going to be six weeks or eight? You know, what's it, what's it going to look like? Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that. Hopefully they, they've got that plan. Um, but you know, this is a, an obvious issue, uh, but they have money and you're, you're not going to have any success professionally without a, a lot of resources that you can put behind it. And, you know, I, I'm frankly more concerned about the AVP, uh, you know, selling uh, to valleys because I'm concerned, hopefully I'm wrong, that that's just sort of a gambling play uh, for valleys and not 
they're not committed to expanding the number of events and making sure they're 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 marketed and promoted and it's just you know the way that company is moving i, I don't know the answer to that but uh, again, uh, I, I think things are so good in volleyball and, and we have lots of issues, you know, no sport is, is lacking for issues, but I, I, I would challenge any of us to come up with a sport that's in a better trajectory, growing club level, boys, high school, men's collegiate. Um, I, I don't know, just at the international level opportunities, professionally, you know, start up professional leagues in the United States. It, it, every every way we look, I think things are going in the right direction, and it's our job, sort of as as a bunch of insiders here, to support and help and aggregate and make sure we don't sort of, I don't know, fight each other and get you know go in different directions. So I'm I'm incredibly optimistic. Wow, that was that's fantastic. Thanks for taking that extra time. Okay, well, that, yeah, hey. we could do this for two hours or more. Yes, that, I know. This is great, Doug, and. Uh, Hey, tell Kathy to put a, a, a seminar together in uh, in Columbus. It's going to be well. Fun. That would be good, okay. wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. And good. maybe we can do that. We we've, we've been yeah. given an hour uh, indoors. We might uh, consider, like I said, now that you're a master coach, we could uh, invite you to come and uh, <laughs> do goodness. something. And think about this before you go. Yeah. Think about if we had an hour on the court, what would you present that you would think? Uh, you can, you don't have to answer this right now, but think about sure. it. What would you present that would be interesting to the coaches and very, very important for, for volleyball, for them to see at all levels. And then could we go into the classroom for an hour and talk about these issues? Uh, I think we have, we have been offered that and we could probably uh, uh, maybe talk with you about being involved in that. So I know you got to run, so we'll, we'll let yeah, you yeah. go. And thank you so very much. And thanks again. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, thanks, my Doug. pleasure, you guys. Appreciate yeah, we'll it. talk. Thanks again. Okay. All right. All right. Bye-bye. All right. That was excellent. So what was your takeaway, guys? Well, I, I think he feels pretty confident that the, the depth of the women's program can, you know, can absorb the, the loss of Lawson and Hill uh, and the future looks bright there. Uh, I think he's more concerned about, you know, a Matt Anderson leaving and who's going to, who's going to swing 35 times for the yeah. men's team. That was our, that was our concern is that man Anderson looked like he drained because he had to be used so much. And over the last three quadrennials, how many balls has he hit, uh, in all those years, you know, he's, I, he's been a workhorse for a lot of people. Hey, so. I'm on a zoom call, but bring it right in. You ready? Yeah. Yeah. You go up the stairs yeah. and right above me. And I'm going to put okay. him on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, mute, him. Yeah. Mute him there. So I, I think, I think those are pretty, uh, pretty significant things. And uh, um, I'd be interested. I'd be interested in what the coaches have to say. I think Doug has the best perspective out there right now. Uh, I I'm interested. He, he talked around the serving thing, Bob, that you asked. But I think he did answer the question, what we all believe is you can't make this many serving errors and not have aces and win. And in, no, and but he, in, in John's defense, the, the problem is, you know, when you got guys swinging as much as Matt Anderson or any of the guys, and then, and then to practice jump spin serving, it's really difficult because you're putting, it's like a pitcher throwing, you know, a back-to-back double headers, you know, and, and every day. Uh, so how do you solve that? that? That's I think that's where we were getting to. That's what he was alluding to. Well, there, there's another part of this, though, is that what does it do to the spectator viewing of the game? It's like net serves in tennis, right? Yep, no one wants you don't to want, see that. Yeah, you don't want to watch net serves in tennis for five hours while right. two people Especially battle Especially two in a row. Court. And you don't want to watch miss serves. I mean, there were six miss serves in a row. No, no, it, it makes the game awful. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's that's a problem the coaches haven't addressed as far as I'm concerned, and I think they have some responsibility because of the popularity of the game. You want the game to become the most popular game. I mean, Poland draws 28,000 people for a men's match. I mean, that's amazing to me, um, but they don't go to watch a bunch of missed serves. Well, you know, one of the other things, too, is addressing the fact is when a kid tries out for their middle school and the coach tells them they have to jump serve 
Well, now you're talking about more jumping, more jumping, more swinging. And then by the time they get to high school, they already got a bad arm. And then they get to college and 60% of the kids are injured by the time they get to college. So, uh, you know, it's, they see things that, that happen, but you don't have to do the same things the national team is doing. Interesting. I did, I did agree that I thought that the, uh, the difference in the game was simply serving and passing uh, uh, for, for the women, the Olympic team. They won because they could outserve and outpass, which made their offense better and their blocking better. So I didn't think their defense was great, but I thought that they certainly have the talent and that I also agree with Doug that um, I thought we had more uh, depth than anyone else. We, we, I thought Serbia couldn't replace their best player. Brazil couldn't replace their best player, but the United States could replace two players and sometimes three with players that perform great. And I think the depth of women's volleyball in this country is, is the key to the wins. And the Brazilian that wasn't there for the final match against USA. Yeah, she was a uh, uh, enhancement performance thing that they'd made her leave. And, um, and so I just thought we were, we, we just have the depth and, and that's it. I do have a, a, a thing that's not everybody's going to like, but I, I want to say this. I think that, um, I think most of the conversation, I, I've always believed this. I, I, you know, the, the women's, my office and the men's volleyball office were next to each other and the guys would hang around and I never, I feel the same way about women and men, volleyball players. They're both, they're such good citizens and good students and great people and, and such good athletes. And they're such, I think they should be sponsored by Coca-Cola or Nike all over the place. My, my concern about this is we spent most of our time talking about the men's game. And, and that's, those numbers are, it's, I think it's bad business. Those numbers are, those numbers are not high enough. We need to ride the women's numbers. In my opinion, those numbers are through the roof and we need to keep them growing. And that's where we need to get our sponsorships. And then the men can coattail and expand on that. And I've always felt from the very beginning, from volleyball magazine in the beginning to USA volleyball, they just didn't understand that it was, if the guys are great, the game is great, that's it. But you got to promote women's basketball has been the great example. They let men's basketball run this thing, sat back, waited, then complained. And they got, you know, women's basketball coaches at the college level. The average salary is a million dollars a year now of the big teams, a million dollars a year. They just said, we're getting cheated. And I just thought what great business sense they had. And, and now they're, they're winning. And I just think the men should coattail on the women. Ruth, you coming out of retirement? Yep. Yeah, that's for, exactly right. A million I, dollars trying, a year. That, 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 I don't disagree with the, with the <laughs> fact that you know, we got to keep pushing the women's game and getting the sponsors for the women. And, and that makes a lot of sense. Yep. But unless we have Title 10. <laughs> You know, it's oh, not be, careful, work. be careful! Be <laughs> you careful! Know, yeah, you, you know what? You're going to be put on blackout. I'm blacking your video and your mute. Well, okay, guys. We we, hey, we are now bringing on our guest, no. who is an expert performance analyst for USA Women's National Team, and Nick, to you to, for the introduction. Hey, Jeff Liu, are you on? Uh, it seems like it. All yeah. right, Jeff, glad glad to have you. For those of you that don't know, uh, Jeff and I had the opportunity to work together at USC for a few years, and uh, I found him to be one of the finest uh, in the video analysis uh, department of people, and now he's become an expert coach also, and he's over at Grand Canyon with Tim Nolan over there now. Is that right, Jeff? Yeah, you know, we're all just riding, uh, talking about riding coattails. We're all just riding mixed coattails here. So. Uh, hey, well, Jeff, Jeff, do not do that. Mick does not need to hear that stuff. Yeah, I get the big head, Jeff. <laughs> you know how that works. Hey, very quickly, though, you've looked at the numbers. You know, when we were at SC together, we looked at numbers really closely. You came up with some really interesting things for us to focus on, and you were really good about coming in and, and talking to the coaches about what the numbers say. 
What significant things did you see in the numbers? You were in Tokyo with the, our women's team. You were doing all of their analysis. Are there significant things that you found either in the game changing a little bit, at least at the international level, or what did the numbers say in Tokyo that made the women's game better or maybe not as good? I mean, if we're looking at sort of a broad stroke of the game, um, I, you know, talked a bunch about the men's game a little earlier. Um, on the women's side, a lot of it's starting to echo um, what the guys are doing um, on the international side. So there's a lot more back row attacking coming on the women's game than maybe there had been um, in 2008 and prior. That's continued to develop. Um, teams like Brazil, um, in transition, we're running over 30% of their offense through the back row. Um, wow. It's just, it, it's one of those aspects of the game where the girls are getting so physical and, and so capable of, of running a quick tempo offense out of the back row. Um, it's something that we're also, um, Aaron Virtue, who, who kind of runs our setters and offense for uh, the women's national team, um, has put a lot of emphasis on us having four routes at all times in every rotation, which just puts so much pressure um, on the block and defense to be able to figure out, okay, who do we actually, you know, dedicate our attention to, to try and block. Um, that's something that's been a trend um, over the last few quads is um, a lot more uh, physical attacking coming out of the back row. Um, you're seeing that quick pick coming a lot, a lot of slide uh, C or 40 or sky or whatever you want to call it. Everybody calls that, that ball uh, being set. In <laughs> you that got the sky in there. That's row. good. Um, you know, there's a lot of those combinations being now done with a back row attacker um, and being done effectively, which, which wasn't always the case. It's something that um, our USA program had shied away from um, in prior quads, partially because we weren't with our, our personnel at that time able to run it as effectively as we wanted to. Uh, could we run it effectively at times? Yes, but not to the point where we could think of it as a real primary weapon. You look at some of the opposites that we've brought into the gym over the last few years between Annie Drews and the arm that she brings, uh, stemming, stepping up huge when Jordan Thompson went down during the Olympic Games. Um, Jordan Thompson as well. Um, some other some other girls that are within our pipeline. You look at Michelle Barsh Hackley um, in in the outside position. Kim Hill in prior years running a really good back row attack. Um, some girls that didn't make it to the Olympic Games. Somebody like a Danielle Catino also coming out of Purdue who can run a really gnarly back row swing. Um, this is something that just diversifies the offense and just makes things so much more difficult for the defense, the game plan around when you can run um, a balanced offense and not just kind of lean on, on one or two hitters um, in every rotation. It's something I think that um, I don't remember who was talking about it before, whether it was Bob or Brian um, about um, the depth that we have in the women's game right now for USA. Um, that's something that we pride ourselves on to diversify our offense and you look at distribution that we had in the Olympic games, we were running our middles 21% of the time. We were running our opposites and our outsides over 35% of the time. Things were balanced. So it's really hard to just say that I'm going to game plan my block to step right. And now I'm leaving two hitters open on the other side. Um, it's, it's significantly more difficult uh, to game plan your defense around an offense that is just so much more balanced. Yeah, where did we score most of our points, Jeff? Did we score most of our points left side, right side, out of the middle? Um, I mean, you know the game as well as anybody, all of us on this call, right? You know, so many balls go to your left sides. So we still still score a bulk of our points um, in that area four. Uh, but for sure, at the international side, which is, I think, um, a little bit different than you'll find at the college game and especially at the high school level and juniors level, um, your cleanup hitters oftentimes with those junk ball situations are your opposites at the international level. You find that on the men's side, you find that on the women's side. So um, I, I would say still you find the bulk of your points on the left side, uh, but you're going to see a lot more emphasis internationally with your opposites taking some really big swings in some really awkward situations um, just to put a big hit on the ball and, and, and see, can we make something out of that? Um, so but for sure. Yeah, so Drews and Thompson, boy, they got a lot of sets. So when they were in on the right yeah. side and back, you know, it, it's one of those things you game plan around having a really balanced offense. And yeah. you know what? Every now and then you take your game plan, you throw it over your shoulder, and you say, set the hot hitter. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's kind of what, what I think. Yeah. Came out against Argentina, had 20 something kills. 
She scored 34, 35 points against China. We have a game plan. We want to overload this, this blocker. We want to run these patterns. Then you go, well, she's been, she's seven for eight on her last eight swings with zero errors. Yeah. Maybe we feed her a little bit more often, right? Just, do you want to be right or do you want to win? That's yeah. what you get it down to. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so game plan, you know, it's just a game plan is on paper for a reason. Paper doesn't go on the court, right? So every now and then you just, you, you got to ride the hot hand. All right. That's Bill Neville said something once. He said he never lost a game <laughs> on paper. Okay. He, his plan always was for a win. And he'd go in with that plan. Uh, obviously, that didn't work out so well for him. But uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I will say okay. game planning wise, Which I thought was up that there? our staff did. Uh, He's not there? No, no, no. But it's. I, I thought our staff did a really nice job. Um, and our players did an even better job of but being super disciplined to the game plans, uh, especially defensively and in transition. And when you look at our performance through the elimination rounds of the Olympic games, our quarterfinal match against the Dominican Republic, who have some pretty physical hitters. You look at a Braylon Martinez, who they played at the opposite this tournament, but has hit on the left and the right for them. You know, she can be a handful of just hitting over the top of any team's blockers. Um, they had a really physical uh, middle blocker as well. Um, you look at um, Serbia um, in the uh, semifinal match, who has um, arguably one of the top two hitters, not in, in any position, um, in Tiana Boscovich uh, at the opposite, one of the best hitters in the world. And then you look at Brazil, who um, is the closest thing to a USA offense that you can find in their ability to serve and pass their ability to run speed um, and diversify their offense and run a lot of offense out of the back row. I thought our players did a fantastic job um, of executing our game plan. And uh, I guess the best way I heard of somebody put it is squeeze uh, the opposing offense. Um, just, just make them feel like we're suffocating them where they had to really try and hit some specific, just really narrow zones or really go for those sidelines and just hit those balls out of bounds, really try and go high over the top and hit those balls out of bounds and being really disciplined on a block for us of just being low and tight and letting them hit high and over and out of bounds. Um, I thought, you know, all the credit to our coaches for sure for, for coming up with a game plan, but our players, I mean, Nothing happens without the players on the floor. And I thought so, they did a fantastic job of executing. So one analyst reported on uh, on the internet that he thought the, the men's game was being played at a very high level. I'm talking about all the teams at the Olympics now. But he felt that the women's, women's matches, there were more errors than usual. There were more uh, plays that were disconnected than usual. Do the numbers show anything like that? Or in your scouting and recruiting, did you pick up anything like that, that people were, were not maybe playing at, at the highest level that they have in the past, or is that not true at all? I'm not going to say it's not true at all. Um, for certain, you're going to go from season to season, tournament to tournament, individual player performance are, are always going to vary. Um, whether it's uh, they're a little bit overtrained by that point of the season, whether your roster changes a little bit differently. All of a sudden you bring in a new starting setter, things are always going to be a little bit different, right? Um, so you have all these teams that played uh, VNL, the Volleyball Nations League tournament prior to the Olympic Games, some of them with totally different rosters than they did with the Olympic Games and they played zero real competition. Now you're trying to get your high intensity competition reps at the Olympic Games. That's a little bit difficult. You're not facing the same amount of stress in a friendly than you are in a playoff round of VNL, right? Um, or some teams, you know, much like we did, kind of mixing and matching a bunch um, and not getting as many reps as maybe they would have in other seasons uh, with their top group altogether. Um, so you're going to find different teams had some of those ups and downs. Um, we were lucky enough that we felt like we were peaking at the right time and, and kind of on an upward trend throughout. Um, for certain, there are some teams where they had an individual player here to there where one match they were out of this world and another match, um, whether it was a matchup thing or not, with the opposing defense, um, just couldn't maintain that level um, of performance. The game all hey, around. Jeff, I got a question a for you because we're getting close on time. What about China? Your thoughts China. on China? Yeah, it was interesting. Um, it wasn't really public, but it's something that we kind of noticed watching them play before we had to play them. Their top outside hitter 
um, had a previous wrist injury yep, lefty. Um, that, that, you know, wasn't really disclosed. And, and so she had had a down tournament and when she's on the floor, um, you know, their offense is, you know, predicated on setting her the ball. Um, so it was interesting to watch after they were eliminated from the games, they played better without her because mm -hmm. then they the played a match. much more balanced game. Mm -hmm. um, so they didn't feel that pressure to have to give her the ball. Um, so it was interesting for us to see that, um, that they actually played better without their best player on the floor. And I think some of that had to do with just her injury and, uh, and some, some other nagging things for their team. So, um, yeah, I, I don't necessarily think that's a, a whole team wide thing. I, I think that it was unfortunate that she was dealing with some, some injury issues that kind of hindered, uh, hampered, hampered her performance. But how about their style of play? Didn't they change their style of play and go lower and faster than normal? Uh, they've been this fast for this entire Olympic quad. Uh, they've been trying to run fast to the pins. Um, they, they'll they switch to a higher kind of out-of-system offense when they need to, especially with that uh, number two, Zhu Ting, on the outside, because they can lob her anything you want, and she can take care of business. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's just one of those benefits that they had with a player of that caliber. When you have inarguably the best outside hitter of the world on your on your team, you just give her the ball. It was like, Mick, we would just give Samantha Bricio 90 swings a night her <laughs> senior year. Right, her arm was, was being held together with duct tape and, and cardboard by the end of that season. But um, it's just one of those things that you're able to do. Um, they, but they've been trying to run pretty fast. Their, their middles run really fast slides and they try and run fast in the pins in general. Okay, we have time for one quick question. That's a 30 second question. So if you, anybody wants to ask one more before we close out, because we are out of time. Brian, I know. Can you do a thirty-second question? Is it in your vocabulary? I, 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 I wouldn't finish the question in thirty seconds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it was it's... nice. It was very interesting. Um, any, anything that you wanted to say? Anything else that you just wanted to uh, give us a heads up about? That you, your observation. Um. Well, it was my first Olympic game, so in, in <laughs> general. To, to go into an Olympic Games and have it be a COVID Olympic Games is always an interesting experience. But I think that the Tokyo Organizing Committee, Japan, um, the IOC, I think they did a fantastic job putting together an event that ran incredibly smoothly based on the pandemic situation that we were in to the, to the point where there was a, I believe, 610 plus thousand COVID tests that they ex executed throughout this um, these games. And there were only 400 positive tests. Many of them were retests of people that were positive. So I think they did a fantastic job of putting on a really nice event. Yeah. Wow. Okay, we're out of time. Thanks for joining thank us today you. for our Buzz Reaction. We thank our guest, Jeff, for providing how a performance analyst can provide great information for your team, your club, or your program. For those coaches that are interested in our consulting services, please go directly to our website, volleyballmastercoaches.com, and click on the contact form and look forward to customizing the in-person or virtual clinic for you. A very special shout out to over 88 guests who have shared their insights with us over the past 64 weeks. 2021 ABCA Convention, Columbus, Ohio, December 15th through the 18th. And you can jump over to abcaconvention.org to register today. Be sure to tell your friends about our weekly buzz show. Thanks for joining us today and see you next week on The Buzz. Jeff Lou, thank you. Jeff, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me on.